Well, I got to be honest with you this morning, you are looking at one lucky person today. On Tuesday, I was summoned to jury duty. I mean, these days they like to call it jury service. But when the sheriff will come after you if you don't report, I'm sorry, that's not a service. That is a duty. And I had jury duty. But like I said, I'm a lucky guy. Because when I called the juror hotline at the appropriate time, that they told me that I did not have to report that my, quote, service had been completed. Instantly, I felt a wave of relief sweep over me. It was my get-out-of-jail-free card. Now, don't get me wrong. I recognize that we have a civic duty to serve on juries when we're called to do so. But i got to be honest, I did not want to get tied up in a trial, especially one that might drag out for a long period of time. You know, after Tuesday, I feel just a little more appreciation for the Roman governor, Felix. Felix had a trial on his docket, a trial that had drug on for a long time. It was the trial of the Apostle Paul. Now, if you remember last week, we left off with Paul in the quote, protective custody of the Roman legal system. Now, given circumstances, it could have been a whole lot worse. Paul was staying in a seaside villa that, was, that had originally been built for, the, for, the, for, the gov- for uh, Herod the Great. Felix was living there at that time. Paul's room would have had a spectacular view with large windows that let in a soft Mediterranean breeze. Felix gave him permission to have his friends come at any time to see him. All in all, it was not a bad setup. But at the end of the day, Paul was still a prisoner. He was waiting for this trial to begin, and it was a trial that Felix had no interest in conducting. Besides hoping that Paul's friends might offer him a bribe, Felix's main objective was to keep the Jewish officials off of his back. And so he just decided that he would keep Paul in custody and drag out this trial just as long as he possibly could, which meant that Felix's successor, an official named Festus, would have to deal with the Paul problem. Now, with that background, let's turn over to Acts chapter 25. Acts chapter 25, we're going to begin with verse 1. Acts 25, verse 1. Listen to what the Bible says. Three days after arriving in the province, Festus went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem, where the chief priests and the Jewish leaders, meaning the Sanhedrin, appeared before him and presented the charges against Paul. You know, the truth of the matter is that Paul had been living rent-free in the Jewish officials' minds for a long time. Remember, Felix had kept Paul in custody. It was... He could still write his letters, but for the most part, it was out of sight, out of mind. But the first chance that the Jewish officials had to bring Paul up, they went to Festus and they asked him to take up the charges against Paul. Look at what it goes on to say. They requested Festus, as a favor to them, to have Paul transferred to Jerusalem for they were preparing an ambush to kill him along the way. Now, here's the thing. The members of the Sanhedrin were too smart to have Paul assassinated on their own. The Romans did not look very kindly on people who who committed political assassinations. They left that for themselves to do. But the council members also knew that there were Jewish groups out there who would have been ready to kill Paul on the spot. Now, if you keep your fingers there in Acts chapter 25, let's flip over to the 23rd chapter of Acts. Acts 23, and we're going to read verses 12 through 15. The next morning, some Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. More than 40 men were involved in this plot. They went to the chief priests and the elders and said, We have taken a solemn oath not to eat anything until we have killed Paul. Now then, you and the Sanhedrin petitioned the commander to bring him before you on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about his case. We are ready to kill him before he gets there here. 
It sounded like a really good plan. Only Festus wasn't taking the bait. Let's go back to Acts chapter 25. Let's read verses 4 through 7. Festus answered, Paul is being held at Caesarea, and I myself am going there soon. Let some of your leaders come with me. And if the man has done anything wrong, they can press charges against him there. So much for the assassination conspiracy. After spending eight or, eight or ten days with them, Festus went down to Caesarea. The next day he convened the court and ordered that Paul be brought before him. When Paul came in, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him. They brought many serious charges against him, but they could not prove them. They could not prove them. The Sanhedrin lawyers had a problem, a pretty serious problem. Their conflict with Jesus involved spiritual disputes about Jesus and the resurrection. Was Jesus, in fact, the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God? Did God raise Jesus from the dead three days after his death on the cross? Which, of course, would prove that Jesus was, in fact, the Son of God. So the, the lawyers had a problem. The Roman government did not care about a religious dispute between groups of Jews. So the lawyers had to create charges out of thin air. They tried to claim that Paul was an insurrectionist, a terrorist, a threat to Roman rule and civil peace. But it was no, there was no evidence to back up those charges. So the Sanhedrin were having a hard time with it. But look at what verse 8 says. Then Paul made his defense. I have done nothing wrong against the Jewish law or against the temple or against Caesar. Paul had presented a very simple defense of himself. He said, look, I'm not a political threat to Rome. I'm just a preacher. And I've never violated the Jewish law or, or done anything to, deserve the to just desecrate the holiness of the temple. In some cases, in some cases the, 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 the case should have been settled right then and there. But look at what it says in verse 9. Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there on these charges? Now, I want you to understand what's going on. By this point, Festus knows that Paul is an innocent man. He should have released him right there on the spot. But Festus was playing Felix's little game. It sounds like he's offering Paul a perfectly reasonable compromise. Go up to Jerusalem with me and stand trial there. Of course, what's really going on is that Festus is trying to get the Jewish officials on his side to make his reign a little bit easier. Festus was ready to do the Sanhedrin a favor, and in turn, he would ask for some favors from them a little bit down the road. But here's the thing. Paul is too smart to fall for Festus's trap. And so look at what he says beginning in verse 10. I am now standing before Caesar's court where I ought to be tried. I'm being accused of sedition, of insurrection. Well, then I ought to be charged in a Roman court, not in Jerusalem. I have not done anything wrong to the Jews, as you yourself very, know very well. If, however, I am guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. Paul had dropped the bomb. He was exercising his right as a Roman citizen. His right said that he had the right to be tried in the imperial city before the emperor himself. I appeal to Caesar. Look at what it says in verse 4. After Festus had conferred with his council, he declared, you have appealed to Caesar. To Caesar you will go. You know, over the years, a lot of Christians have read 
uh, these verses, uh, especially Acts, about verses 9 and t- through 12, and they wonder, well, why did Paul do what he did? He was winning the case. There was no charge. There was nothing the, the Jews could do. Why would he make this all-or-nothing bet that he would get a favorable verdict before the Roman emperor in Rome? Well, it's like this. Paul was not concerned for his health, his safety, or his well-being. This is what the Bible says in Acts 23, verse 11. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage, as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. Look, when Paul stood before Festus, and made his appeal to Caesar, he wasn't worried about the outcome of the trial. Notice what he says. He says, I'm not afraid to die. I don't refuse to die. Instead, Paul saw a God-given opportunity to proclaim the good news about Jesus in the capital of the empire before the emperor himself. See, here's the thing. Paul was wired a little differently than the average Christian. I mean, the average Christian regularly misses the opportunities for mission and ministry that God gives us. Things will be happening. Doors will will be springing wide open. God will be at work in your life. And the average Christian will just sort of dismiss it out of hand. Well, that's really outside of my comfort zone. Oh, just for the record, God isn't really concerned with your definition of a comfort zone. Or they'll say, oh, this is nothing more than chance and circumstance. It's really not God, God's hand is really not involved in all of this. God's not trying to tell me to do something for him. But, but notice something. Paul never missed those opportunities. He was so in tune with God's plan for his life that he looked at each and every situation as an opportunity to share Jesus with others. This is what the Bible says in Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me, and he's talking about the persecution, the arrests, the beatings, the imprisonment that he's endured, all of these things has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, you know, God's been showing Paul how all this fits together. As a result, it has been clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Look at what God's been doing. Even though I'm in prison, the good news about Jesus is being proclaimed. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord. They've seen what I'm going through, and they said, if Paul can endure it, maybe I can endure it too. They've become more confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. And for that, I give God praise. Do you want to have a sense of purpose and meaning in your life? Then here's how to do it. Seek out the perfect will of God. Look for those, sometimes we're so busy waiting for God to do something. God is at work. He's working even now. He can work even in the midst of of a pandemic. God is at work. And so what we ought to be doing is say, God, just give, open my eyes so I can see those opportunities for mission and service and ministry and missions that you give me. You know, Paul's decision to appeal to Caesar put Festus in something of a bind. He knew that he had to submit a written report to his bosses in, in Rome. But how was he supposed to explain some obscure religious debate between Jews? Look at what the Bible says in Acts 25, verse 13. A few days later, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at Caesarea to pay their respects to Festus. Now, this King Agrippa was Herod the Great, the king that was was alive when Jesus was born. He was this, that Herod's great-grandson. As the king, he had jurisdiction over the temple. He actually had the power to appoint the high priest. 
under the system they were operating under at that time. Now, given his background, the Romans considered him a bit of an expert on Jewish affairs. Festus looked at Agrippa and Bernice's visit as a chance to better understand these curious charges that are being made against Paul. You know, I, I got this case. I really wish, I, I wish I could just do away with it, but, but, Fe, but uh, Felix didn't take care of it, so I've got to do something about it. And this guy has appealed to Caesar. So I've got to file a report to Rome. To me, it's just Jews arguing about religion and whether someone named Jesus is a lie. Verse 22. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear this man myself. He replied, tomorrow you will hear him. Now, there's no indication from the Bible or historical records that Agrippa was a religious man. He was not some spiritual seeker who was looking for God's greater truth in his life. The truth is, Agrippa's desire to hear Paul was, was, was strictly intellectual. He'd heard all these stories about the fact that Jesus had been crucified and then been raised from the dead, and he wanted to hear decide for himself whether these stories might actually be true. You know, this is an important principle to, share, to, to remember when you try to share the name of Jesus with people who are lost. Don't spend all your time looking for those people who are already this close to salvation. Share Jesus with anyone and everyone who are, who are willing to listen to what you have to say. Well, the next morning, Agrippa, Bernice, and Festus gathered to hear Paul's testimony. After giving him permission to speak, Paul started doing some preaching. By the way, don't think of this as, as, as Paul uh, presenting a legal case. Paul's trial is going to be held before Caesar. This was an evangelist seizing the opportunity to tell someone about Jesus. Plain, pure, and simple. King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defense against all of the accusations of the Jews, and especially so because you are well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. Have you ever heard someone say, that's a God thing? You ever said that for yourself? Now, to be honest, some of the things that people say are God things, I kind of question whether they really are. I'll tell you what's a God thing, what happened earlier in this worship hour. When God led me to have you share, instead of having the regular time of prayer, the, the, the prayer list that we normally have, and, and during that time, Teresa started talking about how, how wonderful it was that here, here in Sunset Road, we have people who look for opportunities to do, mish, to do ministry to one another. And then the song that was sung, singing about that very same thing. And by the way, I'd never heard, as far as I know, I've never heard that song before. Matthew, you can correct me if you're wrong. I've heard the song before, but I have a short-term memory problem right now. Okay. But I did not remember it. But I tell you one thing, when I was listening to it, I, I said, God, that's you. That's you. Because you put all this together. It wasn't, wasn't me. It was you. Well, in Paul's case, he recognized that his ability to stand before Agrippa and Bernice and Festus and make a, his testimony was a God thing. It was a mighty work of God in his life. Paul had been given the chance to share the good news, the message about Jesus, the message of Jesus' resurrection with, uh, with a man who understood all the arguments, who had control of the temple and could appoint the high priest. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. Paul realized that he could be a, long, a little bit long-winded at times, but he had something important to share, something he, Agrippa, he knew that Agrippa needed to hear. The Jewish people all know the way I have lived ever since I was a child, from the beginning of my life in my own country, and also in Jerusalem. They have known me for a long time and can testify, if they are willing, that I conformed to the strictest sect of our religion, living as a Pharisee. Paul had always been a faithful Jew, 
Someone who had enthusiastically submitted to all the rules and regulations of his faith. Have you, ever, have you, have you seen the new Rocket Mortgage commercial with Tracy Morgan? Anybody seen that commercial? A family, a family in the commercial is, is getting ready to buy a new home. When, when the wife asks the husband, can we even afford this home? Her husband replies, I'm pretty sure we can. That's when Tracy Morgan uh, appears, and he goes on to explain that being pretty sure isn't good enough. He says, I'm pretty sure these mushrooms aren't poisonous, as the father keels over in the background. I'm pretty sure these are parachutes, as Tracy gets ready to push the man out of a, an airplane. I'm pretty sure you do not run, as a grizzly bear is, is getting ready to attack the family. And the catchphrase for the commercial is, certain is better. You know, there are a lot of people today who are pretty sure about their relationship with God. I live a good life. I treat people with courtesy and respect. I, I attend church all the time. I'm pretty sure I'm going to heaven. You know, for a long time, Paul had lived with a pretty sure confidence in his relationship with God. I have the right birth certificate. I'm a Jew. I do all the right things. I follow the Jewish law. I, I'm pretty sure I'm going to heaven. But then... Paul met Jesus on the Damascus Road, and everything changed. Pretty sure changed to absolute certainty. Paul trusted Jesus as his Savior, and he knew that he had been reconciled by God. This was the faith that Paul wanted to share with Agrippa and Bernice. And now it is because of my hope in what God has promised our ancestors that I am on trial today. This is the promise our 12 tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night, King Agrippa. It is because of this hope that the, the Jew, these Jews are accusing me. Agrippa, I'm guilty. I'm guilty. Guilty of believing that God keeps His promises. Guilty of believing that God has acted in Christ Jesus to save the world from sin. Isn't that what it means to be a Christian? To say, I'm guilty. I'm guilty of having faith in Jesus. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? Now, now remember, Paul had already told Agrippa that he was a Pharisee. Being a Pharisee meant that Paul believed in the resurrection. And he could point to all the Old Testament books of prophecy to, to confirm that the Bible had said that a day would co was coming when the dead would be raised. If you want to turn over to Ezekiel chapter 37, Ezekiel chapter 37, we're going to read verses 1 through 6. Ezekiel 37, verses 1 through 6. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out of, by the Spirit of the Lord and set, sent, set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. That's why Paul says to Agrippa, why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises from the, the dead? What Paul is really asking Agrippa is this. Do you believe in God? Do you believe in God? Because once you believe that God created the universe, that He is the sovereign King over all creation, man, the idea that God can raise the dead to life again is a no-brainer. 
obviously, the Creator God has the power to bring life to dry bones. I mean, let's give Him something hard to do. Acts 26, verses 9 through 11. I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme. I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. You know, Paul was about the last person on earth that you would expect to become a Christian. Really. I mean, not only was he a Pharisee, he was, not only was he a trained rabbi, he had been determined to wipe the name of Jesus off the face of the earth. On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priest. About noon, King Agrippa, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. Uh, this, by the way, this is the third time in the book of Acts that Paul shares his conversion experience on the road to Damascus. In each case, the basic story never changes. The resurrected Jesus appears to Paul, and Paul becomes a Christian. But each time the story is told, a few more details are fleshed out. Look at what it says in verse 14. We all fell to the ground. This is the only time that we learn that Paul's traveling companions had any re uh, reaction to the heavenly vision. We all fall to the ground, fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Aramaic was a, was a Hebrew dialect. It was the language that Jesus spoke when he was here on earth. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Let me tell you what a goad was. A goad was a long uh, stick with a sharp piece of metal attached at one end. Farmers used these goads to train their oxen. At first, the, oxen, the ox would, would kick whenever the, the farmer provoked him with the, with the goad. The problem was, eventually, the far farmer would, would keep put pricking and pricking this, this cow and this ox until finally he got the message. He would get tired of the pain and he would obey the farmer. During biblical times, the expression to kick against the goads became a proverb. It meant to resist authority, specifically to resist the authority of the Almighty God. Saul, Saul, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. You may think you're following God's will, but the fact is, you're resisting the power and glory of the living Lord. It is time for you to give up and start following me. Let me tell you something about resisting God's will in your life. And I stand here as someone who's guilty of that from time to time. It will exhaust you. It will bring you more pain and heartache and headache than anything that you can imagine. The easiest thing to do, the smart thing to do, is to surrender to God. Trust me, it's not all that hard, especially when you realize that He loves you, that He has a magnificent plan for your life, that He wants you to accomplish great things for Him, and that He wants to bring joy and peace into your heart. Then I ask, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to anoint you as a servant, as a, as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Here is the heart of Paul's testimony. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus changed my life. And what Jesus had done for Paul, he was ready, 
willing and able to do for anyone, Jew or Gentile, who could call on the name of Jesus. You want to know one of the reasons why a lot of people go through their life and they never accept Christ as their Savior? It's because there are way too many Christians who don't believe down deep in their heart that Jesus can make a difference in a person's life. And if people who are Christians don't believe that Jesus can make a difference and they don't act like Jesus can make a difference, you can be assured no one else is going to believe it either. Have you ever noticed how some of the most effective soul winners, people who can just, you know, tell people about Jesus at a drop of a hat, have you ever noticed how many of these people come from an especially sinful background? You ever notice that? See, these brothers and sisters have experienced a life-changing event. They know the difference Jesus can make in a person's life and they want others to experience the same joy, the same peace, the same transformation that they've experienced. So then King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. After all the things that Paul had heard and seen, did he really have any choice? First to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and then to the Gentiles. I preached that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. This is why some Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But God has helped me to this very day, so I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer, and as the first to rise from the dead would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. Ultimately, All of this comes back to Paul's determination to share the message of Jesus with Gentile people. You know, people like us, non-Jews. Paul's message to Agrippa was, I want you. I want to tell everybody about Jesus. I want everyone to know that they can be saved by the gift of God's grace activated through faith in Jesus Christ. Sometimes I think... The the Jews just want to keep God for themselves. You know, I wonder if if Paul might draw a similar conclusion about Sunset Road Baptist Church sometimes. That at the end of the day, we just want to keep God for ourselves. That's why we we show up on Sunday mornings. We give our tithes and offerings. We sing our hymns and praise choruses. And we expect the gospel to be preached during the morning message. We love God. But sometimes we're hesitant about sharing His love with others. Now granted, we will welcome anyone who walks in the door of our church. But telling a friend about Jesus, inviting a neighbor to church, Explaining the plan of salvation to another person? You can forget about that. That's that's way too much trouble. It's not worth the effort. You know, there's an old Arab proverb that says, the only crime greater than murder on the desert is to know where the water is and not to tell. Look, you and I know Jesus. We've been saved by His grace. We know where to find the living water that springs to eternal life. It's time to stop keeping God for ourselves and be like Paul and share the good news of Jesus Christ with a lost and dying world. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank You for this time that we've had to worship You. And we thank You, Father, for the opportunity that we've had to be challenged during this hour. Because, Lord, it's good to be challenged by you. Because sometimes the ruts we dig are way too comfortable. But, Lord, my prayer today is that for those who know Jesus is their Savior, they'll make that commitment to say, Lord, use me. Help me to stop stop this thing of keeping 
you to myself and, and not share you with others. Help me to do what you've called me to do. And Father, if there's someone who is in the, here in the sanctuary or watching online who has never accepted Jesus as their Savior, then I pray they will receive Christ today as their Savior by praying this prayer. Dear Jesus, I believe that You are God's one and only Son. Jesus, I believe that You died on the cross for me. Jesus, I believe that You were physically raised from the dead three days after Your death on the cross. Jesus, I confess to You that I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I invite You to come into my life and be my Savior. And Father, if someone has prayed this prayer today or just listened and agreed that that's what they want, that's what they believe, then today they become a Christian by Your grace. And Father, I pray that if they're here in the sanctuary, they'll come forward and, and let me know about this decision and, and make that decision to follow Jesus in believers' baptism. If they're watching online, Father, I pray they'll, they'll send me a, an email at the address that's shown on the screen. Father, we do so love You. Jesus, we do love you. Holy Spirit, we do love you. And we want to make that love known to others. We make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.